now. We're going to really focus. Hey, everybody, this is Harvey Sluggo Wasserman back for the second hour of the Green Grassroots Emergency Election Protection Coalition. Uh, first hour for many of you, it's number 157. And we are going to do a deep, deep dive right now on the issue of energy. Um, we have won a major victory this past week, uh, this being November 13th today. Uh, also, I want to commemorate, by the way, well, I remember it, uh, Karen Silkwood. Um, either today or tomorrow, this is the anniversary of her murder by the uh, the Kerr McGee uh, apparatus in, in Oklahoma that was dealing with plutonium. Uh, she is, of course, the subject of a truly powerful film starring Meryl Streep. But anybody who doesn't know about Karen Silkwood, please look her up, and this show will be in her honor. What we're going to talk about in the coming hour with some of the truly most important people and most powerful people on the global energy scene is uh, the demise, or at least a major uh, uh, defeat that has been suffered, thankfully, by the uh, small modular reactor industry, um, uh, which Amory Lovins, who will be joining us, should be supplanted by the small uh, renewable uh, 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 industry. And um, we are we're going to key in at the beginning with Linda Seeley to give us an update on Diablo Canyon, the which is by far, as far as I'm concerned, the most important energy fight in the world today. Uh, the fight to keep uh, the the deal that was made, uh, the solemn agreement to shut Diablo Canyon um, in the uh, in next year, 2024, followed by Unit two, uh, two in 2025. So uh, we're going to talk briefly with that uh, with Linda so she can set the stage. And then we're joined by um, uh, the great Scott Denman, who's been with the uh, issue uh, since the, uh, the 1800s, um, uh, <laughs> who's talking to us from Maine, where we didn't do so well, actually. We'll have to talk about, about Maine, uh, with you. Madam, we have Curie, Madam Curie and I go back a long way, Harvey. Yeah, <laughs> we got Roy Morrison, um, who's been uh, involved in the energy issue since the 1700s, um, uh, who's going to give us a fill-in on renewables. Hopefully, we'll be joined by Robert Freeling and in the middle by the great Amory Lovins. Uh, I don't see Amory on, Amory on yet, but Amory uh, confirmed with me by, oh, there he is, um, that he, he's with us too. And Amory is, is one of the truly towering figures in all of uh, the energy struggle. I see he's at his banana plantation in uh, central Colorado there, um, one of the few homes in the world that has no heat in the middle of a really cold area and grows a banana tree in his in his living room. So Amory, great to see you. We're gonna start uh, now with Linda Seeley for a brief update on, uh, on the situation in California with Diablo Canyon. We're then going to go to Scott Denman, who's going to update us on the the big fall taken by New Scale in um, in uh, the small modular reactor field. Yeah. Then we're going to go to Amory to talk about the global energy picture, and then the Roy Morrison to uh, deal with renewables. And we may be joined by Robert Freeling, who has a lot of specific uh, information about California. Linda Seeley is with the Mothers for Peace, um, um, been with the issue uh, uh, for fifty years. And uh, we are in the midst now of the most excruciating and infuriating fight uh, I've been in with for a long time, where we had a deal to the Diablo Canyon was shut in 24 and 5. And now the governor who signed that deal as lieutenant governor is, is pulling back. Uh, Linda Sula, do you want to give us an update, please? I know the Mothers for Peace is in federal court, in front of the NRC, in front of the various commissions in California. Give us a quick update, please. I think, uh, thanks Harvey for inviting me to come on. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm gonna just keep it really simple. Number one, well, um, Harvey has already said, we're at these various um, um, legal, we're involved in various legal fights. Wanna just make it really succinct for your, uh, for everybody on the call. Um, we've got a nuclear reactor that's built on at least 13 earthquake faults. I was at a meeting this past Thursday of the independent peer review panel, which is the um, panel appointed by the CPUC uh, to um, 
oversee issues about um, seismic, um, new seismic information that's come up. Number one, the in order for SB 846, which is the law that is keeping Diablo Canyon open, in order for SB 846 to um, be in order for the CPUC to be compliant with the law the, before authorizing Diablo Canyon to go on for at least five more years, although in parentheses, PG&E submitted their relicensing application this past Thursday, and it was for 20 years of additional um, operation. And um, Patty Poppy, the CEO of PG&E has made it very clear that they are more than happy to run for the next 20 years. Um, <clears throat> and for end that parenthesis, going back to the independent peer review panel, PG&E is revising its um, uh, earthquake information, which hasn't been um, uh, updated since 2015. And one small bit of information that we got from that IPRP meeting on Thursday <clears throat> is that they've discovered that the um, ground motion under uh, for, that would be caused by a rupture in the Hosgree Fault is twice as much as they had predicted. So that and that just kind of was a statement. Um, it was not something that people jumped out of their seats and went, what? Um, sorry for the sirens. Um, okay. And uh, then we also know that the two um, faults that, are, that run straight under Diablo Canyon, under the plant, um, that those are vertical thrust faults, meaning that those two faults cause much more ground motion that they, than had been attributed to them prior to this. So we've got that. We have an embrittled reactor vessel unit one that if God forbid should have to be shut down very quickly in an earthquake or whatever, for whatever reason, it could shatter like a glass because it's brittle because they pour cold water on it and it's very hot. It could make it just shatter like a glass. Okay, we've got that. We have the fact that this is an incredibly expensive proposition, not just for the ratepayers of PG&E, but for people all over California because the cost is going to be spread over California. Um, and number four, we don't need it. We have plenty of renewables to replace Diablo Canyon. Renewables plus battery storage, plus um, a demand response, plus... Um, um, or oh, other kinds of renewables. Um, so okay. that's it. We don't need Diablo Canyon. We're Mothers for Peace is fighting this as in as many places as we can. Um, and uh, we're uh, uh, Diane Curran is going to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on January thirteenth, where she, where she'll argue our case about the timely renewal decision, uh, which means that they did not apply, they have a rule at the NRC that you're supposed to apply for a renewed license within five years before the ex license. And now with they're doing 12 months prior to um, that, that without without any updated studies. Okay. That, I, I don't want to take up. No, no, you so, got that. was a very I good think, overview. Thank you so much. I want to mention also we have Ron Leonard on who's going to be talking about this issue. We do have a couple of hands. Um, before we go to Scott Denman, let me go to Amory Lovins. Amory in his sunny living room there in Snowmass, Colorado. Um, uh, uh, I was hoping you'd be eating a banana from your tree there, Amory. Amory and I met in 1975 at the Tour Tomorrow Fair in Amherst, Massachusetts, where he laid out really the, for the first time that most of us had heard it the prospects of a totally green powered earth. It was a monumental moment, actually, uh, in the birth of Solartopia. Amory, I'll go to you first. Go ahead, please. There were all kinds of uh, studies and processes set up in the legislation to examine safety, need, and other attributes of Diablo. 
Uh, do we know anything yet about those looking at need? Thanks. We do um, actually. Um, and, and, and Linda, you want to comment on that? Well, a need uh, for the preliminary plan. decision. Mm -hmm. The preliminary decision by the um, CUPUC judge said that we do need it, but we don't need it. And Mothers for Peace has, has filed testimony to that that corroborates that. It's very easy to, um, you know, pull out the numbers. But Amory, your your name and your your fame is so um, respected. If you could do it too. Uh, what Raul Con Conadino, who is the head, uh, the former head of the Mid-Continent uh, ISO, did the analysis for us. And he, I mean, there's, I'll, I can send you his paper. It just shows that we don't need it. Uh, I will, Amory, I'll put you in touch with Linda directly. We've also got Robert Freeling, uh, who's done quite a bit of study on this, and um, uh, Mark Jacobson, I believe, but the the numbers on Diablo, uh, the lack of need for Diablo are staggering. Uh, Tatanka, do you want to comment on that? This is Tatanka Bricka Amory. He's from uh, the with uh, the Romero Institute, Danny Sheehan, um, in uh, in the San, in Santa Cruz area. Go ahead, uh, Tatanka, yeah, and then we can go to Scott Demon. I just wanted to thank you, Linda, for being the steadfast organizer you are, being a neighbor of yours close to the plant. I really appreciate it. Would you spell it out for people when you said, when the cold water hits and a brittle planet shatters like glass, just say what would happen. Okay, the, the, the reactor operates at 5,500 degrees Fahrenheit, right? It's very hot. And after years and years and years of being bombarded by neutrons, it be, the metals become uh, brittle. It not when there it's operating. Not when it's going at fifty five hundred degrees. The ha what happens is like have you ever uh, seen a glass shatter because it, you put a glass full of ice into uh, boiling water. It just shatters. Same thing happens with a nuclear power plant if you have to have an emergency shutdown. We don't know if there'll be an emergency shutdown. There might not be. But there might be, and it's not worth it, and we don't need it, and it's expensive. What okay. is the problem here? Right, and they the don't... problem when the um, problem when a reactor core shatters is, Amory, I, I believe you once wrote a book called Embrittled Power, is that you will get uh, a steam, hydrogen, and possibly even fission explosions coming out of the uh, out of the core with massive radiation releases. Yeah, uh, Scott Denman, I uh, wonder. You're talking about the embrittlement of the pressure vessel. Yes. Correct. Right. So yes. great steel. And uh and what you were just talking about, Harvey, was the zirconium uh or zircaloy uh reaction breaking down water releasing hydrogen. That's the fuel bundle, but the fuel doesn't get brittle and shatter, it's the pressure vessel. And Correct. then the hydrogen can, of course, uh if, if bad things happen, it, it could rupture the containment. Yes, exactly. And um, uh, uh, we want to go now. Uh, thank you, Emery. We want to go to uh, Scott Demon. We did have a major thing. And uh, Emery, you have a, le a letter in the New York Times today. There was a piece uh, about uh, small modular reactors, which you have <laughs> brilliantly come forward and, and advocated for small modular renewables, which is much better use of those three letters. Uh, I'm sure you know Scott Demon. Scott, can you tell us about the um, major uh, event that took place with New Scale this week and what it means for the future of nuclear power? And then we're going to go to Amory to talk about the future of renewables. Sure, Harvey. Thanks a lot. And thank you all for being on the Zoom tonight. I'm Scott Denman. I'm the director of the Independent Council for Safe Energy Fund. Uh, we've been around for 17 years. Uh, supporting the grassroots national and expert uh, transition to non-nuclear, green, sustainable fuels and electrical sources. Um, the small modular reactor is a is a um, figment of the imagination to some extent. 
of the nuclear industry as it is as it has attempted to rebound from the disastrous so-called nuclear renaissance that was begun in the mid 2000s at that time there were 34 reactors that were ordered uh, or planned uh, by utilities uh, major reactors, 1,000 megawatts or more. And those reactors from 2007 until roughly oh, 2012 or so began to build momentum and support and planning at the state level. However, a major uh, campaign was directed, which included a number of economists, Dr. Mark Cooper, uh, Peter Bradford, um, uh, grassroots organizations, uh, national campaigns, especially from Physicians for Social Responsibility, and many others uh, over the next uh, four or five years. And coupled with a disastrous economy at the time and very, very poor planning, um, essentially 20, well, actually 32 of the 34 reactors were either canceled or put into some kind of a zombie-like um, uh, condition and remain that way today. At the time, 2015-16, even the Department of Energy said basically, we're not gonna build any more major uh, 1000 megawatt nuclear reactors, uh, which had been built up to this point. And they began to um, rattle their sabers and spend taxpayers' funds on the so-called uh, small modular reactors. And these are still uh, the designs, largely uh, light water reactors. Now leading uh, the, the uh, vanguard of this was, is a company out of Oregon called NuScale. And they had developed and they continued to push uh, throughout this time period a um, what became the vanguard of the SMRs, the small modular reactor, a nuclear resurgence, if you will. And uh, they their plan was to build this um, a 12 unit module reactor at INEL in Idaho at the uh, federal laboratory there. And uh, each one of these uh, units would be about 50 megawatts. And at the time, the cost, the original cost back in oh, 2013 or so was somewhere around two to three billion dollars. Uh, what New, uh, New Scale did was they went to an organization called UAMPS, that's the Utah Association of Municipal Power Systems. In order to justify uh, the development of this, they needed customers. And UAMPS is, if you remember WHOOPS, the small public utility districts in Washington that were burned so badly in the 70s and early 1980s, uh, created the largest municipal bond default in history when the four of the five of those reactors that were planned in, in uh, Washington state uh, collapsed financially. Uh, well, the, the idea is that, the idea was that new scale would go to uh, and work with UAMPS and its 40 plus member small towns throughout Utah and the Northwest. So they began to develop contracts for uh, immediate uh, initial payments, very small, it's like the frog in the pan of hot water, very small payments for these contracts for electricity that wouldn't be delivered until mm, 2026 or so. Um, and some oh, 28 uh, or more of these small municipal power districts and small towns like um, uh, places like Ogden or, or um, other cities throughout Utah agreed to go along with this. It's, it's, it's a very kind of cozy relationship that UAMPS had with these towns because the power managers for each of these towns, each of these public power districts served on the board of UAMPS. So it was kind of a, if you will, a, a electrically incestuous relationship. Um, and it was hard for any one of them to get any traction with questions about, well, you know, does this really make economic sense at a time when solar and wind are plummeting in price? And 
the cost of the only new reactors being built in the United States at Plant Vogel, which was mentioned earlier, began to skyrocket from $14 billion, original estimate, to what is now over $35 billion. And so the, the, the process of planning went on and the, the, the contracts uh, costs slowly went up with these, uh, for these uh, small towns. And in, um, in roughly 2018, we began to work with the, Heal, the head of Heal Utah, Dr. Scott Williams, to look at whether there was an opportunity for a strategic campaign to peel off these small town supporters and contractees of the small modular reactor that, that UAMPS and New Scale were pushing. Well, the, the um, city councils, the interesting thing here, the democratic link, the hook, if you will, uh, is that the, the, the democratically elected city councils in these small towns were the ones to make the decisions on the contracts. Uh, and the finance directors had a great deal to do as well with that decision-making process. So there was a real opportunity for educating those uh, city councils and finance directors uh, using strategic media statewide and locally, as well as um, contacts, uh, grassroots groups and experts communicating with these dis local decision makers. So over the, over the next uh, uh, three years, um, we supported groups and experts in developing reports uh, uh, and, and working with Heal Utah, um, folks like Dr. M. V. Romana from uh, formerly of Princeton and now with the University of British Columbia um, and other experts to build up a solid case, an economic case uh, against moving forward with the SMR on behalf of these small towns and then moving ahead instead with uh, renewables and solar and efficiency and power storage, all of which were plummeting in price, as I mentioned. So um, the, the interesting thing about this, in order to avoid the whoops catastrophe, the contracts all included an interesting thing called an off-ramp. And this allowed the small towns to get out of the program uh, without further investment at a special designated times. Well, by, by 2020, the cost had risen to um, over $6 billion. And now the cost for the uh, electricity was going to be about $55 a megawatt hour. And the towns were starting to get nervous. One of the studies that, that we supported and Heal Utah commissioned was with a group called Energy Strategies out of Salt Lake City. It was an excellent analysis of the comparative economics between the SMR that was planned and the opportunities uh, and the oppor lower opportunity, opportunity costs for these small towns with green power sources. Well, a very fascinating thing happened in that very, very red state. When that report came out, it was, it was commissioned by Heal Utah and it got zero press, zero coverage for a, an excellent scientific economic analysis, comparative analysis. Why? Well, it's a very, very red state and the state did not wanna hear economic news uh, and those towns didn't wanna hear economic news, those decision makers from environmentalists. So we worked together um, and uh, Dr. Williams and the head of the taxpayers Associ Utah Taxpayers Association had a long-term relationship. And through an educational process, uh, uh, Utah Taxpayers Association became very concerned that this was nothing more than a, a boondoggle, a catastrophic ratepayer ripoff. So what they did uh, was to take this on as a campaign. Now they did not form a coalition with Heal Utah. That would have just 
that would have doomed the effort. But they remained independent, and they reached out to these uh, these uh, city councils and began to educate them on the real costs of this. And they began to communicate with the mayors, the city councils, the media, and with the um, and with the the finance directors. At the same time. Other statewide experts uh, working behind the scenes were able to put out statewide op-eds and analyses. Uh, one of them, um, Ray Davis, is a climate scientist at Utah State um, University. Uh, a, a, state, a Republican state representative wrote a statewide op-ed. Um, uh, letters to the editor. Uh, there were uh, social media ads. And this was focused in the, the, the perhaps the unique opportunity in this particular organizing uh, case was the, these messaging, this messaging was focused on those decision makers in those small towns. And uh, the off ramp came up in September, in September and October of 2020. And just before that, a major analysis was released by Dr. M. B. Ramana in the University of British Columbia. Um, Eyes wide shut. It's a great, a great piece. You can go to the Physicians for Social Responsibility of Oregon website and find that. I can send it to you if you want to see it. But it came out uh, in a in a major uh, press event in Utah and nationally. And what this did, along with all the work that the Utah Taxpayers Association had been doing, along with these grassroots groups, particularly Heal Utah, it turned the tide. And some uh, approximately 12 of these cities turned tail, dropped the contracts, and got out. This was a huge shock to the system for UAMPS and for New Scale. They immediately went back to the drawing board and they scaled down the project from 12 modules at, at 50 uh, megawatts or so uh, um, to uh, six at 77. I think the calculation there is went from 924 megawatts in size to 462, I believe, megawatts. In any event, they they... Uh, also, at the same time, this year, 2023, they came back and said, uh, gee whiz, it's going to now cost $89 a megawatt hour. And we're looking for other investors and we're, we're pushing on there. And the Department of Energy has just invested. Something just happened on the board. Yeah, thanks. The other, the other, uh, um, uh, the other, uh, uh, oh, the Department of Energy, they announced in 2023, had just invested $1.4 billion of federal taxpayer money. So the whole effort then was very clear, trying to prop up what had, uh, you know, basic, what was basically a, a listing sinking ship. And uh, they were scrambling Department of Energy uh, in working with New Scale and with um, with uh, UAMPS to reverse the trend and try to prop up this uh, unproven, untested reactor that, while it was on the drawing board, wouldn't even uh, a prototype wouldn't even be built until 2029 at the earliest. So everything began then throughout the year to look at the forthcoming uh, off ramp, which was going to be in January of this year, and last week. They finally threw in the towel and said, we can't do it. We cannot find uh, additional investors. And they had gone all over the country to find utility investors, private investors, uh, venture capitalists, and so forth. It couldn't be done. Uh, they couldn't show that this was a viable alternative. And they certainly couldn't show that this would be cheaper uh, than any of the renewables that are out there right now. Um, as Lazard says, the, the, the international utility and economic uh, analysis firm on Wall Street, uh, new solar and new wind utility scale are five times or so cheaper than new nuclear. So, so the 
the whole plans have just collapsed. And folks, this was the vanguard. If you go back, as we have done, and do a content analysis of all the media since 2019, it's been an unprecedented tsunami of, Hi. I'll use a, I'll lose a, I'll use a polite phrase, hype and hyperbole, by traditionally thoughtful journalists, uh, and and just promoting the Dickens out of this model and 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 making it sound like the second coming. Well, now let me, let me point out, happy. Scott. I'll jump in. I don't want to be rude, but it's also it. the ahead. it's also the theme of Oliver Stone's insane movie where uh, I had to sit through it because I'm in it. And um, and he's going through all the nuclear stuff and the whole ending of N the Oliver Stone's promo piece for nuclear power is the coming of small reactors. Right, right. Uh, if I may just take a couple, a couple more moments, Harvey. Please. The interesting thing about this, this is not just a single event, a single blip in the road or a bad apple that they that they will call it. The industry is already spinning. You can read it over the last three days, many articles saying, oh, this is just one issue and it's been, it, yes, it's been dropped, but we've got many more and this is the future and we have to have nuclear to fight climate change. Well, in fact, when you look at the pre one of the previous designs called the Oklo, this is a was billed as a mom and pop nuke <laughs> um, they got they got a million dollars from the Department of Energy, and they went to the NRC last year, and they said, "Here it is, this brand new reactor, a tiny reactor. This is going to be great. We can put it in every bar and and hotel and, and on, on your neighborhood corners and things." The NRC took a look at it, and they 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 communicated back and said, "Please answer these questions." Oklo owners hemmed and hawed, and they wrote back and they said a few more things. And NRC said, we're rejecting your request for um, preliminary license approval because you failed to answer our questions. And we'll leave the door open if you want to come back. Well, the Oklo owners uh, have been on radio silence ever since. Case number three. The X Energy small reactor is, is running now into financial problems. Um, and the uh, with they had a deal with AIRS technology, A-R-E-S technology, to develop the SMR. Well, that contract, that um, uh, merger uh, just fell through. So that's not gonna, that's gonna not gonna happen and it's gonna have a significant impact on their SMR research efforts. The fourth, the fourth case in point is Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce has its own design, and it's gone through, it's, it's been running out of funds for the development of, of that technology. Yes, there are other reactors. There's the light more uh, light water reactor designs. There's the molten salt reactor designs. There's the pebble bed designs. All of these designs, people are talking about thorium and so forth. Some of them are not small at all. You know, three, the, the nit natrium reactor that Bill Gates and, and Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett are building with our money, largely ratepayer taxpayer in Wyoming, which they plan to build. Um, uh, that That is um, speculative as well. And many of them use a new fuel that we don't even have fuel source for. Helium. <laughs> so I wanna close by saying, you know, this the if there's anything to take away from this campaign, is there's what's needed on the ground in addition to the to the to the grassroots effort. You need experts, and they're out there, and you need independent economic analyses that cannot be assailed, that come from universities or come from think tanks or wherever they come from, but they have to be solid. But once they're out there, they can't be as solid as having an axe to grind. Two. It's imperative, I believe, after working for, I've, now this is my 45th year on working since the March on Washington, 79, working on uh, uh, transitioning from nuclear power. It's imperative to work with some form of business or industrial users. It's imperative to work with uh, um, libertarian taxpayer organizations, conservative taxpayer organizations, 
that you can find common ground with. This is how this kind of a this kind of a of a non coalition, because once they start to work together, the the right wing fanatics and so forth within some of these organizations complain bitterly to their to their uh, organization and they and they pull out. So it's imperative that you work in parallel, we have found, and not as co traditional coalition partners. So these are the some, some of the things you got to get out there early. Um, they're already working in Wyoming to fight the natrium uh, through groups like the Powder River Basin Fund. And in, in Wyoming, the, um, the uh, Wyoming um, Freedom League, uh, conservative taxpayer group, and others. Um, I also want to give a shout out to uh, Amory, who's uh, done a wonderful job on uh, countering the national, international hype on small modular reactors and these um, uh, <laughs> these multiple new second comings that uh, the the priesthood at DOE and MIT continue to. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, push and and uh, hope to proliferate uh, throughout uh, the U.S. and the world. So I'm happy to answer questions and and uh, well, so Scott Demon, that's <clears throat> magnificent. I'll never forget we were at Seabrook and uh, you were speaking from the stage in 1989, and you said that <clears throat> there was going to be a referendum at, uh, in Sacramento and that we were going to win and shut the Se Rancho Seco reactor. And by God, you were right. So uh, that we have recorded this, by the way, there will be a separate um, e, um, link for it. And anybody who wants to spread around Scott's brilliant um, uh, narration of this, this is a huge victory, folks. This is just an, an enormous uh, shutdown of a complete fantasy. Um, <clears throat> and the next huge victory we need is to shut the Avo Canyon. Scott, and I want to give a quick one to Steve Cruz, and then we're going to go to Amory. Yeah, Scott, um, you see this lobbying going on across the board between local rural cooperatives where they're chanting the we need baseload stuff. And at the same time, Palisades in Michigan, they're looking to restart with a power purchase agreement from a rural cooperative. So, you know, they started this footprint in Utah with these little towns saying they're going to do it. now this disease is spreading into the cooperative quote unquote intelligentsia in the rural areas and then um you know what's worse than a small nuke is a big nuke in michigan palisades it's been mothballed improperly if they were going to let it run again this is according to arnie gunnerston that they should have been cycling the mechanics in the plant if they're going to restart it which they haven't been doing but yet now, Holtec, who's never even run a nuclear plant, all they did was dealt with waste, wants to restart the plant up and run it. And, you know, what, is this their little experiment to see if they can do it or not? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Steve, thanks for that. And and Scott, do you want a quick comment? One one mention, <clears throat> you, you mentioned a, a number of um, allies in this fight. You did not mention unions. And, um, you know, at this point in time, if we can flip the union movement, uh, at least part of it into renewables, and maybe Amory will have something to say about that, that would be a huge help. Well, I, I would add, I would say one thing about the unions in a moment, but I want to add one other thing just as a comparison. Of the nuclear renaissance and the only two reactors that were left, quote unquote, standing with the Vogel plants in in, in um Georgia, and one of them is just about to come online or it's just coming online. The other one will be a couple of years, I assume, if it, anyway. So uh, the cost of those went from $14 billion to over 35 billion and the price is continuing to rise. Um, so the when you look at the cost, I mentioned $89 a megawatt hour, um, an hour for the SMR. Then you add on to that the $1.4 billion from the DOE, because that's part of the price too, right? You can't just simply say, oh, by the way, you know, we're going to charge $89 an hour and we have this bonus $1.4 billion from the taxpayers. So when you add all that up, you're basically looking, according to David Slissel of the um, 
uh, of the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, you're basically looking at an either an equal or a greater cost for the electricity that comes out of the SMR than out of Vogel, which is one of the most one of the three most uh, gold plated uh, nuclear power plants in history and will never produce an economic ion of electricity. So I just I wanted to say that um, with regard to the to the allies, um, we didn't mention the unions because uh, they were not a major player out there other than because the contracts hadn't been made really to start building. They, they, it was a nascent uh, um, promote. They were nascent supporters of the reactor. But what's happening okay. here, what's happening here in Maine? is just that case. We're working right now with 20 unions with a main climate coalition, and we are countering a Christian nationalist state representative who this year introduced an SMR bill. Uh, thank God it was, it was uh, tabled, um, but they've introduced a bill to support nuclear while organizing a massive effort to shut down the big wind port that's now slated for Maine's coast, it would be a most amazing financial and economic jobs boom for this state. The governor just signed the enabling legislation. And this 23-year-old, know-nothing, Christian nationalist, right-wing fanatic is organizing the tribes and is organizing the uh, uh, fisher folks, um, as well as locals who simply don't want the aesthetics of this uh, of this um, wind power uh, plant, this wind power port. So it's this is where we're going to be beginning to help shape, I hope, and work with, and and collaborate with the unions on supporting the wind power port, and saying no to the SMR next year when it comes up. Wow, fantastic! Uh, thank you, Scott, for that. Let's move. Uh, I know Amory's been waiting patiently. And, um, you know, nowhere do we need a, an alliance more uh, with the unions than in, in California. To uh, We have 70,000 people working on, on, on renewable, on, just on solar in California, and just 1,500 at Diablo. Amory Levins, you're the godfather of the green power movement. Um, and um, uh, we just got the paternity test, by the way, so it's been confirmed. <laughs> and uh, 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 what do you got to say now about the future of renewables and the, our ability, hopefully in California, to get the uh, state to agree uh, to honor the 2016 agreement and, and switch to renewables in California? Well, I don't know much about California, but I'd like to add some other thoughts that would be relevant there and elsewhere. <clears throat> First of all, I think we need to uh, debunk the idea that nuclear power is necessary or even helpful for climate protection. It's a very simple reason that, that it, it makes climate uh, protection uh, reduced and retarded. Uh, that is, it makes climate change worse. And the reason is that it costs too much. Uh, Every nuclear kilowatt hour, as you saw in, in Grigory's chart earlier, uh, <clears throat> costs about, oh, in round numbers, five to eight times as much as a, a new unsubsidized renewable kilowatt hour. Therefore, per dollar, you get five to eight times fewer kilowatt hours if you buy nuclear than if you buy renewables. Uh, therefore, you displace about five to eight times less fossil fuel than if you bought renewables instead. Of course, if you bought efficiency, you'd get even more displacement. Uh, <clears throat> and that makes climate change worse because you're displacing less carbon per dollar. It's less climate effective. It's also a lot slower, about a decade slower to build a nuclear plant than solar or wind. So you start saving the carbon uh, about a decade later. Meanwhile, you've emitted a bunch that you didn't need to. Uh, <clears throat> You know, we we ended up buying a bunch of coal plants by counting carbon but not cost. We're being offered nuclear counting cost but not carbon. 
but it's clear that to be climate effective, we need to count carbon and cost and speed, all three matter. And I think if we can get that into the public conversation, it would be very helpful. Now, <clears throat> renewables are moving incredibly quickly, and it's now clear that they're on a global exponential curve, not, not a S curve. Uh, <clears throat> give you a few uh, numbers. In the past decade through last year, the latest annual data available, renewables added 19 times more annual output than nuclear did. So they added as much output, not capacity, but output in 19 days as nuclear added all year. Next year to 2021, 2020 to 2021, Again, that's the latest full year when nuclear output last rose. Renewables added 87 times more net capacity than nuclear. So they added as much capacity in four days as nuclear added all year. In 2022, rene renewables added 986 times more net capacity than nuclear did. And renewable output went up by 625 terawatt hours while nuclear output fell by 130 terawatt hours. You see which way this is going. Uh, <clears throat> another way to think about how quickly things are changing faster than any of the analysts and forecasters can keep up is that uh, there, there are various estimates that evolve uh, through the year about how much solar power the world will add this year during calendar 2023. Well, Bloomberg New Energy Finance's forecasts of that number between October 22 and, and uh, November, no, sorry, between September 22 and October 23. So in 13 months, that estimate rose 44%. And most of that rise was during the year in which the, the growth is that you're forecasting is happening. It's just running way faster than anybody can keep up with. I won't say much here about energy efficiency, except that uh, <clears throat> it is half the world's historic and at least half of its future decarbonization. That's by conventional means. If you add what I call integrative design, like this building, designing buildings, factories, equipment, vehicles as whole systems, not as piles of little parts, then you can save several times more than conventionally supposed, but at lower cost and often with increasing returns. So if you add up the two or threefold upstream, that is conversion efficiency gain that the world will get from going to renewables and electrification, plus the one or two percent a year routine incremental garden variety efficiency gains from stuff like insulation and caulk guns and uh, better motors and lights and so on. It's going to add up to the International Energy Agency's higher target of four percent a year, about twice the recent average. And that's not counting integrative design or saving materials, like we now know how to save about half the world's cement and steel by better structural design. Uh, and it's not counting uh, any behavioral change or a lot of other stuff, but altogether the, the corticopia is much bigger than we thought on the demand side. So the argument you hear is all about, uh, you know, I'm putting in the fruit salad a better kind of fruit than you got. But what really matters is the cornucopia is unimaginably big and can make up for a lot of shortfalls if we have them in renewables. You might pay attention to a Haas school, HAAS from Berkeley report came out last week on how you could get the, the U.S. grid 80% of the way to being able to support 90% renewables if you just used a better power line conductor, transmission line conductor, 
with more aluminum, so it carries about twice as much current. There's actually even a better technology than the one they described. I won't talk about it because I advise that company. Uh, but um, that that basically says uh, that the uh, concerns, some of which are legitimate, about not being able to deploy renewables widely or quickly uh, because we won't be able to build transmission in time are overblown. You can reconduct your existing lines, same towers, no new rights of way, and uh, double or triple the capacity of the transmission grid. That doesn't cover everywhere. They don't always go, the lines don't always go now where you would need them, but enough of them do that you could de-bottleneck the grid enough to greatly speed renewable deployment. And I think that's just starting to enter the conversation. The firm I advise just got the the top innovation awards this year from both Public Utilities Fortnightly and um, Edison Electric Institute, which is a sign the industry is paying attention. I want to say a little about small modular reactors, not so small. <clears throat> um, basically, the the argument is that although they cause, well, let me back up. Um, Renewables, as a matter of physics, don't scale down well. That's why we make them billion watt size, gigawatt size. Um, and small modular reactors are supposed to uh, make up for their loss of economies of scale uh, by getting mass produced. Uh, well, the loss of economies of scale by most literature is about a factor two. That is, the their electricity will cost about twice as much as the very uneconomic big reactors we have now, initially. That's before you mass produce them. And then the big reactors we have now are on the order of five to eight times more expensive per kilowatt hour than solar and wind, let alone efficiency. And then by the time you could build enough SMRs to be able to decide whether you want to build a factory to start mass producing them, the renewables are very clearly set to get another factor two cheaper. So that's two times five to eight times two. So that's a factor of, let's see, do the math between 20 and 32 times out of the money. And that's, you are not going to get anywhere close to that by any kind of mass production. It, mass production doesn't work that way. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, maybe with transistors, but not with big complicated machines. Uh, now, you will hear it said that the levelized cost of energy or LCOE numbers that were in Grigory's chart and that I've just repeated in the factor of roughly five to eight cost disadvantage of new nuclear over unsubsidized renewables, that mm -hmm. that is the wrong metric because it's comparing they say intermittent uh, renewables with baseload. Well, the right word is not intermittent, it's actually variable because solar and wind output uh, do vary a lot, but in a highly predictable way. The word intermittent is best reserved for big thermal power stations, nuclear or fossil fueled. Uh, because their variations are uh, their 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 forced outages, their their uh, failures are uh, highly unpredictable. They tend to be bigger, longer, more abrupt, and far less predictable than those of renewable portfolios, and <clears throat> therefore they require more backup, more firming to get to the same level of reliability when integrated into the grid. So if you actually do count, as you should at some point, the system cost of grid integration, that actually makes renewables even more expensive, uh, excuse me, makes, makes, makes nuclear more expensive relative to renewables. That is, it widens the cost gap that nuclear would have to overcome to compete with renewables. I also think we should not adopt the obsolete sort of antique honorific baseload uh, that is often applied to big thermal plants. That dates from an era over a half century ago when 
those big thermal plants, steam raising plants that would run most of the time uh, were uh, considered the essential foundation of running a stable grid. Uh, and uh, other than big hydro, they were the cheapest thing to run. So you would run those as much as they were available, fill them in with intermediate load factor plants like, well, lately combined cycle gas, and then run uh, gas or oil peakers uh, <clears throat> to meet the highest brief demands. Well, <clears throat> we don't run the grid that way anymore, uh, and we don't need to. In fact, if you look at the November 1st interview that Jesse Jenkins at Princeton, who built a lot of the models that say we need a lot of clean firm generation, uh, his interview on Dave Roberts' site, uh, Volt, you will find him saying at 71 minutes in uh, that actually we don't need base load. We need plants that follow renewable output because now it's solar and winds that cost almost nothing to run. You should dispatch them whenever they're available and everything else should follow the net load of that variable renewable output minus demand. Well, it's not just minus demand, it's also affected by timely use. There are now 100 odd experiments in three continents over 14 years showing you can get at least 30 to 50% uh, peak reduction from demand response if you combine price, technology, and information. There are, in fact, not just efficiency and demand response, uh, but uh, a total of 10 carbon-free ways to keep the grid balanced on all necessary timescales. Uh, and <clears throat> some of those are very big and negative costs, that is profitable. Uh, the most obvious being efficiency. We showed in a book uh, 12 years ago called Brittle Power, how to quadruple US electric and use efficiency at an average cost, only a 10th the, the price of the electricity that we're saving. So obviously we should have bought a lot more than fourfold efficiency gain, but we didn't directly compare them as we probably should have. Uh, and therefore that gap wasn't quite so as obvious as it should have been. In contrast, Princeton's Net Zero America study with very impressively granular detail of all the enormous transmission expansions and materials needs and other hassles will run into expanding renewables, that assumes two to four times as, as much electric demand as we found, even though we should have uh, bought even more efficiency than we did. And that's because they made some very simplistic and uh, rather sketchy assumptions about efficiency instead of analyzing how much can you really save at what cost. One other very important bit of literature that's come out the last couple of years is about how much uh, backup or storage do you need for long periods when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow? Well, <clears throat> this is most exemplified by the dreaded Dunkelflaute or dark doldrums in Germany and in Europe generally. And in, I think, November 21, the 99.999% reliable uh, former East German grid operator, 50 Hertz, and their Belgian partner, uh, Elia, put out a wonderful study that used most, I would say about six of the 10 grid balancing resources that, that we've analyzed. And what they found was uh, you would then need only one or two weeks max of storage against the Dunkelflaute, the storage of green molecules like hydrogen or ammonia made by operating uh, when you aren't otherwise using them. That's most of the time. 
the extra solar and wind capacity that you build against bad weather to run the grid stably. And uh, <clears throat> that's only equivalent to about a 6% need uh, or 6% of, uh, of winter generation. So it's not trivial, but it's perfectly manageable. And importantly, it is not a need for months or seasons or years of storage as is otherwise, as is often claimed. That simply doesn't stand up to analysis. Uh, and if you want to get high needs for backup and, and especially for long duration storage, uh, you can get that just by leaving out most of the solutions. Uh, that's what a lot of published work has done and continues to do. And it will, they'll keep doing that until we don't let them get away with it anymore. Uh, and the costliest of the 10 methods is giant batteries. Now, giant batteries work extremely well in Southern Australia, for example, South Australia, where they have incredibly rapid and precise response to uh, grid glitches, like when a big lignite plant fails, happens pretty often. They're very lucrative, they work fine. And uh, the last year, let's see if I recall right, uh, South Australia was about 72% just solar and wind, just variable renewables, and in October, 87%, both records. But <clears throat> uh, that doesn't mean you need batteries everywhere. In fact, I haven't found a case yet where you actually need batteries if you properly use that full portfolio of 10 ways to keep the grid in balance. Uh, that needs a lot of further analysis, but I think the the writing on the wall is pretty clear that the you, you do not need full or much or indeed perhaps any backup of variable renewables uh, with big batteries if the portfolio of variable renewables is efficiently and timely used, properly diversified and forecast, properly integrated with dispatchable renewables, which are not trivial, and industrial cogeneration, and integrated with, among other things, uh, bidirectional electric vehicles. There is finally a, another little paper, also in late 2021, from NREL, showing that if you just apply in the U.S. conservatively assessed building efficiency retrofits, that by itself eliminates the supposed need for long duration storage by about a factor 10 and in four important zones eliminates it entirely by the way the buildings behave differently when they're in their loads. So I, I hope that, that those hints can help all of you be more effective in meeting some of the arguments that you will encounter in the wild uh, that I think simply misrepresent how grids will work. As the former chief strategist of uh, MISO, Midwest Power Pool, uh, nicely said, uh, in the old grid, we forecast demand and scheduled supply. In the new grid, we'll forecast supply, renewable supply, and schedule demand. And we can do that in a way that's unobtrusive and not at all inconvenient to the customers. Thanks. Fantastic. Amy, thank you so much. That's really mind-boggling. We are obviously uh, sailing into the third hour here, but we want this uh, this unit on energy will be a, a modular, a small modular uh, <laughs> unit that we will make available um, uh, to everyone. Amy, our number one alternative um, uh, motive for having you with us, uh, aside from your absolute genius or in addition to, is our desperate situation in California. I'm sure you're very well aware of the 2016 uh, agreement that was signed by Jerry Brown, Gavin Newsom, the unions, the utilities, the um, uh, regulatory agencies, the local governments, and the environmental groups. And I'm sure you're you aware. Had a lot of that, yeah. I'm sure you're aware now that Gavin Newsom has decided to negate that uh, agreement. 
And uh, what we need most, and we're not getting, we're getting what you mentioned of ignoring the solutions. We had a report from the California Energy Commission that's just an abomination. And Linda Seeley is very well aware of it. Maybe she'll want to comment uh, from the mothers. But what we need most of all in California now is a definitive uh, argument showing why Diablo Canyon should not continue to operate. They're in their refueling mode at Unit 1 right now. Um, they, you know, it was supposed to f uh, shut next year. Uh, it has been shown to be embrittled all the way back in 23, 2003 and five. And uh, they, they're not even testing for embrittlement during this shutdown. It's outrageous. But the bottom line is that they are claiming that they need Diablo Canyon to fill in for possible blackouts. Can you help us with that? I have not followed it in detail, but before that decision, my impression was that the uh, that even PG&E had favored the shutdown because it would draw a lot more renewable power into the grid, uh, which they often couldn't carry because uh, Diablo power was hogging the lines uh, and the right. inflexibility of this big plant uh, was actually not an asset, but a handicap to uh, least cost grid operation. I don't know what has happened that would have changed that technical logic. Uh, and uh, I don't know more importantly, what it would take politically to make sure that there's a searching and independent assessment of need, but with the pace of both efficiency and renewables, and what we're now learning about how much faster and bigger it can be, uh, and demand response, I, it's really hard for me to imagine how a uh, a uh, case could be made that would withstand critical scrutiny for keeping the plant running. Uh, it just doesn't make sense from anything I know, uh, and. That's why I asked Linda what we're learning about the various studies underway about need. Can anyone else shed light on that? Well, Linda, go ahead, please. Tell, uh, 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 tell Amory what's going on here because it boggles well, the mind. Yeah, it's it's very puzzling, Amory, because the you know studies that we commissioned by um, I think the the slide is up there right now. Um, yeah, from yes. Raul Conadina. Um, it, it clearly shows that we have enough. We don't need Diablo Diablo Canyon blocks renewables. This isn't a. This is not a decision about the need for power in California. It's a political decision. No. It's it's about Gavin Newsom running for president, and I don't know the next part of it. It might be. I mean, I know he, the Biden administration is tremendously big on nukes, and it may be part of a deal that he's making with the Biden administration. I don't know, because it doesn't make sense. It's Can we go back to that chart for a minute, too? I, I just wanted to point out one thing about it. There was a deficit in, I believe, second quarter... 2024 on renewable additions versus forecast need. And that was the time at which we were getting a, a burst of uh, press announcements about how renewables obviously aren't adequate. You, you see what I'm talking about? These. I, I think it was 23, wasn't it? Oh, it was 24. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, maybe I have the quarter wrong, but it was, it was during that that period between the first and second lines of the upper chart. And that's what, that's when we're told renewables are obviously and inadequate. We need this to keep the lights on, but, no, but also, go ahead. They disqualified the California energy commission disqualified over 10,000 megawatts of solar um, from the, from their state analysis. What Rao did, was take the numbers from the California Energy Commission, even though they were flawed. They disqualified them um, because, let's see, our, they didn't meet, 
I'm, see, I don't know that much about this stuff. RA requirements. Um, no, you're saying they disqualified 10,000 megawatts of. Exactly. Degree? On what grounds? Because they didn't meet. Oh, the I, it's it's an, an RA requirements. Does that make sense? Or let's see this slide. Oh, uh, grid grid constraints. Yeah, D guarantees by excluding ten thousand two hundred thirty megawatts of multiple renewable blah blah blah, uh, because it competes with IRP procurement orders. Um, <clears throat> and I don't yeah, know what. In, I in other words, giving it. nuclear priority on the grid, even though it costs more to run than to build and run the other stuff they're disqualifying. Right. right. And that's why this is obviously a political issue rather than uh, an energy issue. And mm. <clears throat> that's what makes our fight so difficult because anybody with, you know, two lobes and a brain knows that we don't need Diablo. But... Um, tell that to Gavin Newsom and his crooked CPUC um, who like they don't care they just do what he tells them so, so we're hearing rumors that he's reconsidering and of course obviously this is the biggest energy de decision in the country right now because Diablo is supposed to close next year and if it does then California will join Germany as the fourth and fifth largest Economy in the world, economies in the world to be post nuclear. Well, I thought your news about about the seismic stuff was pretty important. Uh, it's very important. But it's the money that's going to decide it. If we can make the definitive case in California that these reactors are not needed, and that that they're generating power a billion dollars a year <laughs> over market, I think we'll get we might get some traction. I do too. So we have a new plan. Mothers for Peace, we are putting together <clears throat> a white paper about the cost of Diablo. Um, it's just being started by some people um, on the East Coast who are really good at that. So, um, and I want to tell you something too. That this is something that became very clear to me last week when I was at the um, uh, Public, Public Utilities Commission meeting that Mothers for Peace is the only group in California that is hiring great experts to do the work that needs to be done, the calculations that need to be done. And we are, we have, our experts are extremely um, uh, qualified and believable and um, they've written terrific um, analyses. Our problem is getting the administration and the CPUC and the California Energy Commission, the Independent Safety Committee, and the in Independent Peer Review Panel, and the Department of Water Resources, and all these different agencies that are involved in the extension of Diablo Canyon's life. There, this is a situation where everybody is passing the buck to everybody else. It's like... Uh, who's on first kind of situation. So um, we're gonna need good political organizing. Um, we're gonna have to put a lot of pressure on our state legislature because they wrote this bill that kept but, Diablo Canyon open and they can unwrite it. They can write and, another bill. And, and we think that the, the economic argument will be the clincher. If we can yeah. make the definitive case that this, there, there's one group, TURN, I'm sure you're familiar with TURN, has argued that operating Diablo will cost an, an extra $10 billion over the next 10 years. So, Amy, if you're at all willing to jump in and help us here in California, I think we can win. Uh, and, and, and if you, you know, if you work with Linda and, and negotiate uh, to, to move forward together, I think this would be the definitive moment where we can actually get Diablo shut. And the time is nigh. It now. We have, <laughs> this is it. Yeah. 
So, um, Amy, we hope you've got your interest in that. Um, Linda and you are are in in touch here, and um, um, you know, I'll tell you what: if if you can shut Diablo, uh, we'll give you the lead singer role in the next Muse concert. You and Bruce <laughs> and Bonnie Raitt together can like do a trio. I'm I'm way over committed on other stuff, but let's talk <laughs> on the fly about how else to get this done. Okay. okay, we think it's doable. We we think it's within reach here. Were you involved? You must have been in the 2016 negotiation, right? Nope. Okay. All right. Uh, very quickly, Justin, Ron Leonard, Eric, and Wendy, and then we have Roy Morrison, to, uh, who's about who's, is going to present as well. Uh, Justin, go ahead, please, and Ron. Justin? Sure. Uh, so in all of the uh, discussions here, a theme that keeps rising up and maybe a good strategy for argumentation is this idea of the stalking horse, uh, where putting forward an argument that says like, oh, this little thing over here mm -hmm. just solve everything, like the small modular reactors as an excuse for doing the other program that they actually want to do, which is probably nuclear weapons. Um, but uh, so I was curious very strongly about, Amory, what you said about new transmission um, through Haas uh, Berkeley School, um, because if that is indeed the bottleneck argument that they're making uh, through the CPUC and others, then it seems like that is a pretty uh, easy shutdown for their uh, their stalking horse arguments of, you know, what gets priority and so on and so forth. But uh, I wanted to take it to the next level and say, you know, if the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing or who's on first kind of thing, have we also considered bringing in Jerry Brown because he did negotiate the 2016 agreement a little bit uh, and has uh, also negotiated the shutdown of San Onofre. Uh, and, you know, there may be some payoffs necessary here, but there seems to be also clout from the executive level that could be brought in. Hmm. Well, Jerry's an interesting idea. Sharp as a tack. Just talked to him a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I don't know if he'd be willing. Uh, I think he's enjoying retirement out on his farm um um but uh clearly we we lack polit political leverage we need uh and i don't know enough about california to know where to get it okay um well i think you'll find i'm gonna it's, uh ron i know you've been waiting but scott Dem and wanted to really quickly jump in, then we'll go to Ron Leonard. Yeah. Scott, go ahead. Uh, thanks a lot. And I'm I'm sorry, Ron, for interrupting any others. Um no problem. I, I want to make it it perfectly clear what the need is here for Mothers for Peace. It's money. Money, they've got the best le legal team they could have with people like Curran and Bradford. They've got the best scientists on seismic work. They're working on the economics. What's needed is money. They need a minimum of several hundred thousand dollars, folks. And if there's any way that this group could come together, maybe with Bonnie, maybe with others, hold a Zoom concert or something, Harvey, if, if you could swing that, we need to raise money for Linda and the intrepid Mothers for Peace. So that's one clear and present need and danger because this rock rib legal fight and regulatory fight will fall through if we don't have money, if they don't have money. And our foundation is is putting money into it. We have and we continue to do so. That's one thing. Quickly, um, uh, Amory's piece, I just listed Amory and Ed Smeloff. They had a piece uh, last August on why Diablo should be shut down. That was in the San Francisco Chronicle. It's in the chat now. And then I think that if if it's possible to get a group like AIFA, David Slissel and others, uh, or uh, maybe an economist from Cal Berkeley uh, or another California college that independently could do a financial analysis, that could have a tremendous impact. That tactic um, has been very, very successful around the country in campaigns 
especially on the economic issue. And of course, Amory, I realize you're fantastically busy, but um, any further engagement you can provide is wonderful. And I just thank you for being the shining light for the last uh, 50 years in this country for making this transition. We couldn't have done it without your amazing and, and leadership uh, on the uh, soft path way back in the 70s. Well, I, th all... I think, and you're 100% right, Scott, I think that a, the, the rock solid cannot be shaken economic analysis uh, would actually get uh, media coverage in California. There's actually quite a bit of media um, uh, questioning, unlike Utah, um, uh, of, of why Diablo Canyon is going forward. It's on shaky ground. And uh, if we have the definitive economic piece with people like Amory and others signed on, uh, I, don't think that, I don't think they can get around it, frankly. That's my sense of the political situation here. Uh, Ron Leonard, a, a, a great expert on this. Ron, go ahead. Oh, Scott, that presentation that you gave us was uh, mind blowing. Uh, you said things that I didn't know. I'm sure Amory feels the same. Uh, and Amory, uh, since I have you on the line, I, I think your, your ears are probably ringing last Thursday. I brought your name up before a group of 800 people um, in the New York Solar Energy Industries Association because I said that there were three geniuses that I knew and two of them were in the, in the room with me that I was trying to honor. And I, I gave your example because I could prove that you were a genius. Uh, Jimmy Carter uh, gave you an award, so you're certified. And the <laughs> genius that I that I wanted to uh, uh, give you notice on uh, is father and son, Richard and Mark Perez, who I'm going to try to hook you up with. Uh, Mark and Richard uh, have come up with a way of doing 100% renewable energy and get rid of this uh, variable factor and uh, do it economically. And uh, this has taken off around the world. Uh, this started six years ago. And it's so good that DOE tried to take claim for the idea. So I, I know it's perfect. And uh, what Harvey brought me up here to do was to uh, go over this craziness. I happened to be in the UN uh, 15 years ago on the floor with the uh, guy that they said to uh, solve the problem of energy 15 years ago. And what he concluded was the solution to energy in the world is renewable energy. And when he said that, their mouths just hung open. They didn't know what to do. Uh, they knew they opened up Pandora's box. And the first thing that occurred after they had to agree to his solution was that Canada brought up the idea that we're going to, of course, have uh, nuclear energy certified as a renewable energy and it will fix everything. <laughs> well, guess what? Somebody else came up with the same idea just recently and that somebody else is New Hampshire, no less. New Hampshire wants to certify <laughs> nuclear power as renewable energy. And this is the quote from the article. Climate and clean energy advocates in New Hampshire say that pending proposal to define nuclear power as clean energy could undercut solar and wind power in the state. I think so. And uh, although the details are still in the works, State Representative Michael Vose, chair of the Legislature Science and Technology Energy Committee, is drafting a bill that would allow nuclear power generators, such as New Hampshire's Seabrook Station, to receive payments for contributing to clean energy grid. Now, get this. Not okay. only is nuclear power the most expensive, they want to give it more money so we can prove that we can waste more money than we know we have. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. I should mention, Amy, Ron is a longtime uh, solar developer. And we also have Roy Morrison with us in New Hampshire. Actually, I don't know if he's still in New Hampshire. He's going to join with us in a moment. Let me get Eric Lazarus and Wendy, and then we'll go to Roy Morrison. Again, Amory, I, I do want to encourage you to look at California. We desperately need you here. Go ahead, Eric and Wendy, and then we're going to go to Roy Morrison. I do want to point out also, by the way, that we have a guy, Paul Newman, um, uh, uh, is uh, actually has a solar house in LA and uh, it works great. He's one of our pioneers here. And um, he's also started quite a few major motion pictures, but that's another story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eric Lazarus and Wendy, real quick, please. Eric, are you unmuted? Go ahead, unmute. And then Wendy, please. Eric? Uh, Wendy, 
Either of you and unmuted? No. Yeah, um, Harvey, okay. um, I've, I've uh, clicked on Eric asking him to unmute, but. Okay, Wendy, maybe... are you unmuted? I am, I'm ready. Okay, Thank Wendy, you. Um, uh, Amory, and Wendy is one of our co-organizers and she's in Florida. Go ahead, Wendy, please. Thank you. Um, and I just want to quickly say for the radio listeners how beautiful the backgrounds are for our guests. Scott has a beautiful gallery behind him, and um, okay. Amory's background I thought was fake at first, and Linda. No, that's actually Amory's house. <laughs> I'm I'm right my, my 81st passive solar banana farm, banana crop behind me, uh, at 7,100 feet up, where it used to go to minus 47F, but we have no heating system, and that made it cheaper to build 40 years ago. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we have to have you back on just to talk about that. That's amazing. <laughs> okay, so, go ahead, um, Wendy. <clears throat> thank you. So I um I have one point, but I just wanted to reference something that Linda um had said before about we we had mentioned the weapons and um in the this year's uh defense budget, the NDAA, the Biden administration like laced within <clears throat> it. If you delve in and read the fine print, there's a lot of um minimum like quotas basically of how much depleted uranium the DOE is supposed to supply the um, Department of Defense. And so I think that that's a missing link for like, why is all this, you know, um, crazy stuff happening that makes no sense. I think that that's a big part of it. They probably have a whole lot of depleted uranium and it's used almost entirely for munitions. Bang, bang. A little bit of it goes into new fusion weapons, but I think it can't be very much. Yeah, they want to like um they have a bunch of new space programs as well for space okay. nuclear and it's, it's worth checking out in the, on the 2023 NDAA. Um the okay. the reason <laughs> thank you. Um the reason I raised my hand, thank you is um is we before in the in the chat it was brought up about hemp and I know hemp is being they're experimenting it with with it for graphene and with batteries and um just being cuz it's so easy to to grow and it's it sequesters carbon and regenerates soil and just if you if either of you know about the potentials for that and then anything else like as far as like small scale wind i live in a, in a very um latin community and it's like um very common to have small windmills um in the yards as ornaments but i just keep thinking why aren't wow. these actually utilized so um it could even be made into art so any comments you have on that is greatly appreciated thanks for being with us no uh, there is a new kind that goes on the edge of a commercial building roof that looks quite interesting uh one thing one quick question i want to ask you amory is um uh, batteries and sodium um what do you think of the idea that uh, sodium is going to change the nature of uh, storage batteries it won't be mobile but uh obviously well for stationary batteries it it may get cheaper uh i mean you need to be very careful with sodium <laughs> and, right uh, it's um yeah, it, it's it's one of many ways to get around expensive materials. Uh, and batteries will move from the costliest of the 10 carbon-free grid balancing resources to somewhere in the middle. But even then, the stuff that's cheaper than that and often negative cost, I think, is still going to continue to win and make it pretty hard to find big uses for batteries. You know, if you go to a battery conference, the conversation is all about my battery is better than your battery, but nobody wants to talk about what what conditions must any kind of battery satisfy in this much bigger competitive landscape. Uh, so I, I think there is so much focus on batteries, which was driven by cars, but originated in cell phones mm -hmm. that... Uh, it's it's rather reduced our wide angle view of all the ways to do that job, uh, and it's true that batteries behind your meter can make money just as big utility batteries make money, but being cost effective just means that benefits exceed costs. It doesn't mean there isn't a cheaper way to do the same thing, and there are a lot of cheaper ways that are getting uh, too little attention because. Uh, very few people are taking this whole system view of how to make sure the grid stays reliable as it becomes renewable. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I can't seem to unmute uh, Eric Lazarus, who's had his hand up. Eric, we'll have to give you a rain check. I do want to introduce you, uh, Amory, to Roy Morrison. He's our last 
uh, uh, segue presenter here. Roy has a long history in uh, in renewables. Uh, Amory and Roy, uh, say hi to each other, please. And Roy, I, if introduce us to what you want to say. Yeah, I, I, Amy and I met a long time ago in Cambridge, Massachusetts in like 1976, I believe. Hmm. Uh, well, that is a long time ago. Yeah, I, I'm 76 today. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy birthday. Yeah. Happy birthday. And Roy, did you uh, did you want to uh, uh, talk or start to move into your uh, presentation? Yeah. Yes. So uh, uh, essentially, um, so um, so the you know so re renewables are clearly the basis for the global energy future, and we're talking about maybe a hundred trillion dollars of capital is going to be expended in, in, you know, in the next several decades on renewables. That's an enormous amount of money. And, you know, it, and what's the largest agglomeration of capital that exists is, had been uh, all the power plants that providing global, you know, fossil fuel power plants providing energy and, you know, and dams and other things you know, when the renewable transformation, what does that mean? You know, that there's a, enormous amounts of money and the, the model of who makes that money, you know, is, you know, so that that's why they want to run Diablo because it, you know, it's a, it's a big chunk of capital and they make money by charging rate payers, you know, for the expense. You know, so the higher the rates, the better it is for the owners. You know, they don't they don't care. I mean, you know, so the question is, what can we do to make instead of just being customers to make all energy users, energy owners of the renewable energy systems, primarily solar, but, you know, also wind and geothermal and other things, but focusing on solar because solar. Uh, allows us because it's there's a, a the good news is there's a, a really large structure of ability to to make money by doing solar so the the in the United States there the investment tax credit it was it's 30 percent at a minimum it goes up to 70 percent there's accelerated depreciation if you build nuclear if you build renewable plant there's uh, reap grants from the USDA that's up to 50% grants for building solar uh, okay. you know so that essentially there's the ability to build solar perhaps with zero capital down or at most 10% capital down so that energy users, instead of just being customers, you know, so that it's possible uh, to take advantage of all these tax benefits to allow, instead of, if, if every city should be owning all its own renewable energy, whether through co-ops or municipal power or associations. Um, so the, the question is, why is that rare? You know, so typically now a lot of people get involved in uh, community solar and community solar as it exists is largely a scam in that you know, I'm a developer, a solar developer. I can build a community solar facility and I can recruit end users to be the, to take the power and I'll be able to give people a 10% or 20% or maybe even a 30% discount, but I'm making the money from it. I own it, you know, so it, it it's, it's marketed as community solar, but in fact, it's it, it's uh, it 
it's not owned by the community. Well, uh, can, Amory, have, have you got experience with that uh, to co coordinate with Roy on this? Uh, what is your experience? I do. With I, do. I have that experience if you want. All right, uh, go it's ahead. Simply, sim simply the fact is that community solar is the alternative for people whose roof do not face the right wire, do not have room like an apartment owner to get a discount on the energy. The problem is under the federal IRS rules, there has to be an at-risk owner for these projects. Otherwise, you can't take the tax deduction. So you can take the tax deduction yourself. You happen to be a billionaire and have lots of taxes to pay, but most people do not. So the taxes are absorbed by other entities and those entities do have to be the holder of record for that project. And that, that has to be held for at least six years. That's why not everybody in his brother-in-law owns a community solar project. The rules change, we think, on uh, January 30th of this year, where the IRS has said that would, they would make direct cash rebates to new owners like nonprofits, towns, villages, others that really haven't been able to do this before. But let me reinforce the, the general message. I think you said over decades, there will be hundreds of billions invested in renewables. Globally, solar energy alone is investing over a billion dollars a day right now, which is more than oil and gas gets. Mm -hmm. right that sink in. Uh, yeah, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, I, I think we're... Uh, we are the, the first trillion watts of renewables took 15 years, the second one, five years, the third one, three years, the one that will finish early next year, two years, pretty soon we'll be exactly. adding a trillion watts of renewables every year. Right the costs come down. Meanwhile, because as Tom Friedman says, the more you buy, the cheaper they get. So you buy more, so it gets cheaper. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, uh, is a very powerful positive feedback loop, uh, but I, I I think your hundreds of billions of dollars is already happening every year. I was saying trillions. Hundreds oh, of... I'm sorry, I misheard okay. you. A billion here, a billion there. Yes, yeah, <laughs> trillions, and it'll take decades. A thousand billion is a trillion. <laughs> right. Okay, Roy. Do you want to, Roy? We're getting late. Do you want to wrap, Roy? Sure. Roy? No. So so basically, you know, as was mentioned. Under the Inflation Reduction Act, everyone who builds group builds solar, you're you don't have to have a tax appetite. They will cash that out, you know, so that you can sell your your tax credits to someone for like a three percent discount. So if I if I build a if if you build a a, a ten million dollar solar project, and you get a a thirty percent discount, I mean thirty percent tax credit. Uh, you get a three million dollar tax credit. And you'll end up with about two point seven million dollars in cash that goes, you know, and that is more than enough to pay for the in, to finance the system. You know, it's a fundamental ability so that people can become energy owners. So the you know, the question is for, for communities and in, and groups to organize themselves to be able to take advantage of that. You know, so th there are good venues on the financial side to make that happen. So what's necessary to do is to be able to partner with solar developers who are, you know, that you can work with uh, and I can help you get the finance to make the, the whole thing happen. You know, okay. so it's it's real. So if you people can contact me uh, and I can make connections to various people who do that, that kind of financing uh, under the IRA and to sell uh, and, you know, so that you have a combination of, of loan capital, ITC capital uh, and a small amount of your own capital. And that can become by, you know, that can be loaned by community financial institutions, by credit unions, by unions. So it's, it can be a fun, you know, so instead of a world where util large utilities own the energy infrastructure, 
everyone can own be owners of the energy infrastructure. You know, fantastic, and Roy. Uh, if you'll put your the, uh, the links in the chat, that'd be great. It's a great vision, and um, I'm really glad you were able to contribute it with Amory and Ron here. I do want to point out, um, Amory, you may not be aware, we've been talking about on our calls, the California Public Utilities Commission has recently made two um, inexplicable anti-solar uh, rules. And, uh, and, and uh, one has to do with net metering, and the other has to do mm -hmm. with community um, uh, mini grids, micro grids. And um, uh, we will pass them on to you. I mean, they're, they're real head scratchers. Uh, we haven't been able to figure mm -hmm. out where this is coming from, but it, it's not good, especially in conjunction with uh, Newsom's apparent um, uh, commitment to keep Diablo going. So um, uh, this is this is something. And Roy, thank you for bringing uh, that that aspect of community ownership up. Um, uh, Amory, do you, uh, 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 Justin has a quick one, and then Amory, if you want to summarize, uh, we can uh, let you go eat a couple of bananas and. Say hi to Judy and uh, the whole deal. Okay, <laughs> I am. Um, go ahead, Justin. Uh, Justin, are you done? Uh, go ahead. All okay. right. Thank there you for the time. I am a um, couple of Sorry. points to follow up with what you just said, Harvey. Uh, uh, the CPUC is also considering income based and fixed billing for PG&E on top of all those things. Um, wow. But anyway, so uh, I wanted to, for a a a Amory's sake, uh, to mention Nathan Iyer of Rocky Mountain Institute, I-Y-E-R, uh, has been working with the American Prospect to bring out uh, things such as you and Roy Morrison have been talking about and uh, Ron Leonard, you brought up as well. Um, so I I'm uh, wondering, uh, you know, other avenues that we're thinking of popularizing these things uh, you know, for like a consumer level analysis of why it would be good to own things publicly. And the, part of the reason is Maine just went through a ballot initiative in which they didn't yeah. seem to get the value of public power as opposed to foreign owned corporate power, uh, electricity and such. And so uh, I'm wondering, you know, what sort of media or infographic plans we have for all of this. Okay, Amory, the floor is yours. You've been a magnificent guest. Really great. To, it's been an honor to have you on. Great to see you again. And uh, you look terrific and happy birthday, for God's sakes. Uh, I'm all, I'm going to be 78, so you're a spring chicken in my book. And, uh, I, know, I, I credit you uh, at the Tour Tomorrow Fair in 1975 for uh, birthing the concept of Solartopia. You and uh, William Hieronymus. And um, uh, you know, yeah, the the, the strides. PC, was there. I also tell people, Amory, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I tell people that if people at the Tour Tomorrow Fair had predicted in in 2023 what the prices would be of renewables, that they nobody would have believed them. No, uh, uh, and, and they, they would not believe how far we've come. What do you say to that? They're right. Uh, and I would I would refer you all to a couple of things on the RMI.org website that Rocky Mountain Institute have put out lately. Uh, one is called X hyphen change. There's one on electricity and one on cars, both by a brilliant uh, financial teller uh, from uh, Carbon Tracker called Kingsmill Bond whom RMI hired a couple of years ago. And he's a much better storyteller than I am and has a, a very clear view of the structure of the renewable revolution worldwide. And then secondly, if you look up his uh, publications on rmi.org, you'll find another big series on uh, peaking, or you could just look for peaking at rmi.org. And that's... Um, that's the way the energy supply uh, from fossil fuels goes through a peak, a bumpy plateau, and then a fairly steep terminal decline. And the reason is that renewables and some efficiency 
uh, take up uh, all the growth in demand for energy services. And the only place that can come out of is the fossil fuels uh, that we're supplying the rest, nuclear being uh, small and stagnant. Uh, and uh, we are now in the bumpy plateau, but basically it's over the past couple of years, 22, uh, three, that renewables have caught up with and started to get ahead of service demand growth and over the next few years, uh, renewables are growing so fast, they will clearly exceed it. And we'll start to see the accelerating fossil fuel decline. Uh, and there's there's stuff out in the last few days uh, indicating that China's energy peak uh, is probably uh, next year. And that is wow. of course, the, the pivot for the world. It might be a year later, but... Mm -hmm. 2024 is looking more likely. Wow. So th things are moving faster than one realizes, but you know, the fish doesn't know it's in the water. So when you're in the biggest <laughs> technology transition since the invention of agriculture, uh, it's hard to know you're in it. That's why Kingsmill Bonds material is so remarkably uh, useful in understanding where we are and I think that big picture can give us all a lot of hope. And the last reference I would give you is to Google Lovin's Applied Hope, and you will find a, I think, Berkeley commencement talk I did called Applied Hope, which I hope will give you some, because you're all practicing it every day, and we all need more of it. So happy well, and, and, and it's always we great uh, not only celebrating your birthday, but also as Scott Demon so beautifully narrated this incredible victory over the small reactors, which you have in, in your inimitable fashion have renamed small modular renewables. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. And but you know one thing we have to emphasize, Amory, is that there's still 94 reactors in this country. And they're, every one of them is absolutely terrifying. You know, these are these are forty year old junkers that you wouldn't drive down the highway uh, and can't get insurance. And uh, you know, the peak of the iceberg here is is Diablo. And any help you can give us will be greatly appreciated. As I've said on ad nauseum, I want to thank Roy Morrison. Beautiful presentation, Roy. Thank you. Roy is a veteran of the Clamshell Alliance, by the way. And Ron Leonard, who's been in the business forever. Justin, as always. Paul Newman for actually having solar panels on his rooftop. And um, I, and Justin for his brilliance, as always, uh, uh, Wendy Tatanka. So uh, it's been an honor to have you on, Amory. And um, well, an honor uh, to be here and, and just, just all go practice Raymond Williams' truth that to make to be truly radical is to make hope possible, not to spare convincing. <laughs> and well, I want to go. thank you for your cons I want to thank you for your consistency, Amory, because not only did I see you in Massachusetts, I saw you on Alexandria, Virginia in 1975, where you were promoting the fact that we need to conserve energy. The best energy that is produced is the one that's not used. And you used to run around with fluorescent bulbs. I will never forget <laughs> that presentation that you made back then. That was wonderful. Well, now we have much better stuff. We oh, do I indeed. But, all right, I everybody. Oh, thank you. Wait, wait. Before y'all go, I just want to beg you all, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's free. We're really trying to grow it. Four people subscribed today. And now we have 28 subscribers. We only had 24. <laughs> But we're growing, and um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat one more time. It's free, so just please help us with that. And I I, I apologize for the interruption, but I think this is important. And are you going to send out the uh, chat so we'll all have those references? Yes, and we'll send you yeah. also the link. We we made this a um, um a unique a unique link. So this two hour session. Uh, uh, which we've conducted is available now, and you uh, as it's as a standalone. So we have uh, Scott's brilliant narrative followed by your 
uh, brilliance as well. So it's it's a really good piece to have. I, it will be rebroadcast on radio uh, in New York on Thursday night, and it, as it's, you know, it's now online and it will be archived, so uh, we can use it and reuse it. And when you come here uh, to California, you can stay in my house and we'll have a big party when we shut Diablo Canyon. All right, uh, we have two more. <laughs> Final hands, just to say goodbye. These are great people, Wendy and then Tatanka. Go ahead, Wendy and then Tatanka. Thank you. Um, something that was on my mind that um I wanted to jump on earlier and, and talk about, but I thought I was being attacked by ghosts. My computer, none of my apps. All right, go ahead. Been... Thank you. Um, so something I've been thinking about a lot this week, particularly um, I've been witnessing and. I think all of the talks, because I was listening on YouTube, um, everything that we were talking about with, you know, um, what's happening in the Middle East, um, what's happening with the attack on democracy, what's happening on the attack of renewable energy, all comes down to um, just the extremists that were mentioned earlier. I've been collecting petitions for the abortion rights, the reproductive rights in Florida, and for a few months now, and I'm just witnessing the dark side of what people are just outright coming out and saying things that they would never be able to say before. And, and these are the people, the forces that we're up against in everything that we're working on, no matter what your issue is, the just this deep fascist mentality where people think that their will that they call God's will or whatever will they think is um, superseding any type of humanity i've had i've had people i had a guy on saturday tell me that um that a woman's body isn't entire entirely her own um i've had um people a guy that and like an hour or two later um a guy that's a lobbyist told me that the separation of church and state doesn't matter i've had people tell me that the constitution doesn't matter and these are all because i'm just trying to have the voters have a say what we're doing with you know not just our bodies but our rights and our laws and letting the voters just have a choice in what our laws are well, and it yeah we're just going to really need to make sure that people go out to the polls because nobody is interested in biden or trump okay the younger generation. so we just really need to mobilize and understand the true darkness that we're up against because i've been seeing it and it's a lot darker than we even realize so thank well, you it, it, the, the good news is that two things have been steady and successful. No nukes. As you'll remember, Richard Nixon talked about the dark side in, two, in 1974, said there'd be a thousand atomic reactors in the year 2000. And thanks to Amory and Scott and other people like, and Ron, other people like them, uh, in 2004, there were 104 and we're down mm -hmm. to 94. So thank God for that. Mm -hmm. And Solartopia, the vision that Amory put forward we didn't call it Solartopia back then, but uh, it was uh, the road not taken, actually, is what your mm -hmm. phrase was. But actually, <laughs> we have taken it, for God's sakes, for to a certain extent. And the more we do, and Amory, uh, uh, Wendy, your work out there on the grassroots is absolutely essential as well. So thank you for that. We'll finish with Tatanka. Uh, go ahead, Tatanka. Uh, uh, give us a, uh, uh, a good night, Mrs. Calabash, please. Well, Scott also <laughs> has his hand up, Harvey. Oh, Scott does. All yeah, right, go ahead. Sorry. And then we got we got to finish. So let's. I know Amory needs to go. So go ahead to talk and Scott, and we will let the man go. Thank you. I just want to thank you, Harvey. You and Amory set the tone, uh, and Roy set this tone of of critical, clear intelligence with with this positive spirit. And I just want to thank everyone for their contributions. And Amory, as we ask for your help. What I'm what I'm convinced is that we can find a way that doesn't take up much time. We don't need, you know, we've got the technology to have you show up with a with a signature or with a quick zoom and the same the same for everyone here. So we can find a way that is, um, you know, that can peak our energy to, uh, you know, top off what's need to be done and achieve these things. So the positivity here, I just want to thank you, Harvey, for setting the tone with Amory of something that is really important. And um, to let you know, Amory, that you probably don't know that uh, Dolores Huerta is a fan. And so she says, si se puede. So I'm giving that yeah. to everyone. Yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Scott. Thank you. 
Go ahead, Scott. You're the last. Thanks. Thanks to everybody on this uh, great, great podcast. And Harvey, thanks for all the work you've done over the decades and decades. And I love your pompadour. And the uh, <laughs> thing I wanted to say was, uh, first of all, Wendy, I applaud your courage. Send me your send me your contacts. I want to send you some money. Um, this is the essential thing. You are on the front lines of saving our democracy, and I'm not bullshitting. It is it is exactly what you said. It is the dark fascist, um, you know, heinous uh, undercurrent that's been allowed. It's the Pandora's box. It's you could call it a myth, but it's reality and what's been opened by Trump and his minions. Enough said on that. Thank you for everything you're doing. It's fantastic. Um, the other thing is I put three studies, uh, links to SMR studies, economic studies in the uh, uh, chat. And I also encourage you in terms of the future of nuclear to get a hold and go just go to the Union of Concerned Scientists website and look up the analysis of the advanced reactors by Dr. Edwin Lyman. It's the best thing that's been done on the whole planoply of techno fantasies. And it's a tremendous uh, resource from a scientific perspective. So, and thank you all for having me. And it, and it worked for God's sakes. Thank you. you won it. So Amory, you get the last word. Happy birthday, brother. Uh, you look, you, don't look a, you don't look a day over 75. You really don't. <laughs> <laughs> sing it. Bob, to be exact. <laughs> happy oh. birthday oh. to you. Happy birthday, happy to, birthday you. to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, you. Happy happy birthday, birthday to you. And good. And with that, no, no nukes, cool everybody. Event. Wonderful birthday present. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're the greatest, oh, brother. You're, You're really the greatest. Birthday. Take Come down, we we'll put you up. We'll have the big Chef Diablo party, and we we love you, and everything's great. No Thanks. nukes. No nukes. Go no solo. Take care, buddy. What a great two hours! My God, fantastic! Couldn't have been better. Wow! Well, thanks for speaking yeah. around with us, Amory, and all this fun. Thanks for keeping us going, Wendy. We appreciate it. Say, no uh, nukes. I would like to say one thing. Um, in response to what yeah. um. Scott just said, I don't know if he's still on or not, but um, because I actually do get paid for the um, the petitioning, they they pay well because the craziness okay. that we're about to. But if anybody wants to donate to this call to the grassroots EP dot org donate, this is the platform that we get the message out on, and I'm be I'm able to talk about this with a greater audience, and then we can in turn use our efforts to raise money for you guys and in the other groups. So if anybody like as much as I would appreciate and love <laughs> the money myself, um, I really want to support what we're doing here so we can support the greater good. So um, the, the links in the chat and just thank you so much. We have to have you guys back. Thank you. Love you guys so much. And and will you, we will use some Don't of it to buy Amory a cake for his next birthday. There we go. <laughs> really? Carrot cake. Yeah. Thank you. So okay, I you guys. thank you all for the meeting that doesn't want to end. Isn't it great? <laughs> <laughs> Wendy, don't forget, Wendy, that a few pissed off women told us in this last election that the bad guys are going to lose and you're going to win. It's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Okay, yeah, you guys. Got we got it. it. Thank you. We are the light. You guys are beautiful. We will win. Si se puede. No, you so are great. Si se puede. Buenas noches. And remember, no two weeks Later. from now, not next week. Two weeks. Have a great couple of weeks, everybody. Big hugs. You too. Hugs. Later. Bless you all. All right. Good night, all. Much love. Good night. Thank you, Roy. Hey, I'm ending it now. I miss you already. <laughs> Sluggo, you guys, you, everyone, you're the best. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.